Hello everyone, I am the Comics Kid 2099 and I am here with my co-host Connor Nielsen. Connor, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing so well this morning. Uh, I got a good night's sleep and I am ready to talk Twin Peaks, which is a few, which those two are a few of my favorite things. Yes, uh, today we are going to be talking about uh, Twin Peaks The Return, also known as Twin Peaks Season 3, Episode 14. Uh, Connor is going to tell us a little bit about what happened in this episode. Connor, take it away. So the episode opens with maybe the most anticipated phone call of the season. Gordon Cole calls the Twin Peaks Sheriff's Department. This is really exciting. We get a fun little quirks between Lucy and Gordon Cole, between both of their little quirks, because when Lucy's on the phone, she's startled by how loud Gordon Cole is, and Albert just has to sit there in silence and wait for Lucy to uh, end her redundant descriptions. But eventually he does talk to Sheriff Frank Truman as he is returning a call from Sheriff Harry Truman. This is intriguing. But we can get into that a little bit later. But what we get down to is Frank Truman says that they had received information uh, from Garland Briggs, from that tube, that pertained to information regarding two Coopers. This extremely intrigues Gordon Cole, and he says he cannot discuss uh, his comment, but he does thank the Twin Peaks Sheriff Department for their information. He hangs up, and then we go to uh, Albert and Tammy. They are discussing the Blue Rose case, what is presumably the first Blue Rose case. He explains that they were on their way to go find a woman. When they arrived at her apartment, there were two women, and one shot the other. The woman who was shot was the woman they were there to find, and before she died, she said, I am like the Blue Rose, and then disappeared. The woman who fired the gun was also the woman they were there to find, and she says that uh, she didn't know who the other woman was or something, and she didn't know what was happening, and they were going to put her on trial, but then she hung herself before they could. And this is how, I guess, the Blue Rose got its name, because she said, I am like the Blue Rose, and I guess the Blue Rose is something that is not natural, and it is something that is mysterious. So this is kind of inf uh, very interesting to me anyways. Uh, then Gordon Cole enters, gives him the thumbs up, and then we don't see through the window. But uh, there is a figure who is just running a squeegee over the window very loudly. This scene really creeped me out. We don't get a good uh, sight, but I think this might be one of the woodsmen. And get used to me saying this scene really creeped me out. <laughs> um, because this episode, I feel like David Lynch really leaned into his horror sensibilities. I also think that Mark Frost, there are a lot of classic Mark Frost ideas here. Uh, this episode, more than any, I feel really felt like a really nice marriage of the two uh, writers and visionaries behind this show. But what happens is they are asking Diane what she might know about so the information they found in Major Briggs's body and how this is a Blue Rose case because he he supposedly died many years ago in a fire, but he actually died only a few... Uh, sorry, he, he might have died like 25 years ago, but he only died a few days ago. Um, and they found a ring in his stomach that said, To Dougie, with love, Janie E. And then... What's, his, what's her face? Diane says, wait, 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 hold on. My half-sister name is Janie, and she got married to a guy named Douglas Jones, but we all call him Dougie, and her nickname is Janie E. And I went, oh my god! My mind just about exploded in on itself, and that she revealed that, they, uh, that they're estranged, but he, uh, but sorry, but that she last remembers Janie E living in Las Vegas. They call the L.A. department, and they find out, oh my god, there's like 23 Douglas Jones that live in the area. What are we going to do? And there's a humorous bit where one of the men say, we are the FBI, this is what we do. Um, anyways, this uh, eventually leads into Gordon Cole talking about how he has a Monica Bellucci dream. And in this dream, he remembers information I guess both he and Albert just forgot about from Fire Walk With Me. And in this dream, she says, we are like the dreamer now, but who is the dreamer? Uh, we are like the dreamer who lives inside the dream and then becomes the dream. But who is the dreamer now? I don't know. It's all rather uh, enigmatic, but it was cool. And then we jump back to Twin Peaks where uh, Bobby laid out some sandwiches. And then this is all a ruse to get Chad into a room so that they can arrest him. Yeah, take that, Chad. Stupid idiot. And then uh, they, they, they take him down before they put him in jail, before leaving to finally go to Jack Rabbit Palace. So they walk through the woods some, and then they finally get to Jack Rabbit Palace, 
which is a place near where Major Briggs worked that he took Bobby to. Uh, and they put soil in their pockets like they were instructed to. They walk some distance. And then in the woods, they find smoke. But also there, they find that weird Asian woman from part three who was in the weird floating room in space who was all jittery and she had eye, her eyes sewn shut. Um, they find her naked and dying. But then they also find a vortex opening in the sky. While Andy is comforting the uh, woman, he looks up into the sky, stands up, and disappears. And he is, I what I'm assuming, is taken to the White Lodge. It is the white, black and white space where we fat first where this actually season opened where cooper was talking with the giant and andy is there and he's sitting in the same spot that cooper was sitting in the opening scene of the season and the giant comes to him and says i am the fireman now we officially have a name for the giant he is the fireman what appears in andy's arms is like a weird uh genie's lamp is what i'll describe it as smoke comes out of it and then above him, a light appears. He looks into the light and he sees visions of things that uh, we've already seen, but also maybe of things to come. He also gets clues. He sees uh, the two Coopers. He sees the weird woman with horns blowing Bob out of her mouth. We see the, the, the woodsman dancing around the convenience store. We get all this sort of footage from part eight. We all see the woodsman saying, got a light. Uh, very creepy scene, I thought. Before he uh, is, he also sees a vision of himself and Lucy. Mm -hmm. uh, but after this, he returns down to Earth. But what happens is they are all back at Jack Rabbit's Palace, which is about 250 yards uh, west from where they were. And they don't remember what happened. But Andy comes back holding the a woman with her eyes sewn shut, and they he says we have to go back to the uh, sheriff's department to return. Um, anyways, back at the Twin Peaks Sheriff Department, Chad is in captivity and is being a you know his usual jerk self. But there's also this drunk who sounds like a baboon and is really creepy. I think the scene is supposed to be funny, but it creeped me out more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, anyways, after this, uh, we get some uh, footage with. James, uh, I, it took me a while before I realized it was James, but he's talking with that British fellow that he first met in part two that you thought was Andy and Lucy's son. Yeah. Uh, his name's Freddy, and he's a better Iron Fist than Iron Fist. Um, I know I'm maybe the 40th person to come up with that idea, but it is something that is sticking, and I hope it sticks, because his five-minute explanation for why he needs to wear this glove and it gives him the power of a sledgehammer as a better Iron Fist origin than the 13-hour Iron Fist origin we got back in March. Um, he basically says that he got a dream from a man calling himself the Fireman that told him he needed to go to a store and buy this one uh, gardening glove. Uh, and it's in the store only as one in a bag, and it's already been opened. And he says that when he did go to buy it, that... The person wouldn't sell him, and he says, no, I'm buying this. He puts the money down, and he runs. The manager follows him out and chases him down, but he put the glove on, and his instinct was to fight. And then he punches him, and it just knocked him out cold. And he apparently now has the iron fist on his right arm with this gardening glove. And he talks about how he once tried to take it off, but he got a nosebleed, and he didn't feel well. Uh, we also find out that it's James's birthday, so happy birthday, James. Uh, he goes up to go check the furnace. And in doing so, he finds uh, – he hears that ominous hum, and he finds a, uh, a door. I don't know if this door is where he will find the hum or if this is just the, the furnace. Uh, but he approaches it, and then that's about it. Meanwhile, we catch up with Sarah Palmer. She goes to a bar. She sits down, and she orders a Bloody Mary, and then, which I think is actually a pretty clever touch. And this really obnoxious person – is trying to hit on her and she says go away and he you know braids her calls her many expletives uh and then she creepily approaches him and says do you want to blank with this she removes her face like laura removed her face before we see a hand come up but it, like laura she had a white light uh, emanating from her face there is a weird blackness under Sarah Palmer's face, and we see the image of a left hand 
where the ring finger, the spiritual finger that Gordon Cole talks about, and I think part four or five, is covered in black, and it stands out. And uh, we also get a creepy smile. And then she, uh, I guess, rips apart this person's neck. And then she freaks out, and everyone's like, whoa, what did you do, lady? And she says, oh, I didn't do anything. Um, we jump back to <clears throat> the roadhouse. We go back to that booth that gets a lot of action. And these two women are talking. Uh, one is talking about how uh, they knew Billy. Uh, remember that crazy Billy guy that we only heard about a few episodes ago? Well, this woman's mother is Tina, who is the person Charlie, Audrey's supposed husband, called to get information that she wouldn't tell Audrey. Uh, we find out that this woman knew Billy, but she was the last person to see Billy alive. And she knows that she was with her mother's, and she was at her mother's house, but she couldn't remember if her uncle was there. And uh, Billy showed up and then was bleeding from his nose and mouth, jumped over their six, six foot fence, like vomited up blood into their sink looked at him and then just ran away. And that was like, she was the last person to ever supposedly see Billy. Uh, the Roadhouse has another performing guest. This time it's Lizzie. I have no idea who Lizzie is, but she sings a song and then we roll the credits. All right, Comics Kid, how did you feel about this episode of Twin Peaks The Return? Uh, it was okay. Uh, I didn't hate it. Uh, I've been getting kind of burnt out on Dougie and all of that stuff, and this didn't have any Dougie, uh, so I was happy for that. Um, I thought it was okay. Uh, like you, there were some moments that were really creepy, um, but I'm not really sure what to take from this. Uh, it's getting more and more difficult to talk about individual episodes because it's like taking a five-minute chunk of a movie and trying to discuss what that means without the rest of the movie, and we've both said that many times. Uh, it's okay, but uh, there's a lot here that I think will make more sense once the series is over, or maybe it won't. Um, I'm seeing more and more people on Twitter, they're thinking that this series isn't going to be tidied up with a nice, neat bow when it's all done, and that there will be more stuff uh, left hanging than answered by the end. Mm. Okay. Um, I, I saw last night, before, I, see, I watched the episode this morning, uh, but I was on Twitter last night, and I saw Sarah Palmer was trending, and I did not see any spoilers, uh, because a couple weeks ago, whenever James sang uh, Just You, uh, you know, that song from the original Twin Peaks, I saw that all over my Twitter timeline. Uh, this time, I just saw on the side of the screen that Sarah Palmer was trending, and I did not check to see what it was. Uh, I figured it would be something huge, and it's weird, I will give them that, but I don't know if it's huge. Um, I was expecting something, like, really huge, like uh, Sarah Palmer is going to be just absolutely crucial in the season, and I'm not sure if I would go that far, uh, but it was weird. Um, I think, yeah, okay, first off, um, I feel like I say this every single time, uh, there's a new episode, but maybe my favorite episode of this new season, oh. I, I love this episode, I thought it was incredible, it was creepy, it was scary, it was a lot of, a lot of portals popping up, it was, I felt like we got a lot of traction, we got some more expository stuff from the FBI, oh my god, it was incredible, I thought, um, but when it comes to Sarah Palmer, I think this all but confirms that she is the girl from part eight who the bug crawled into. Okay. Uh, I wasn't sure if it, I wouldn't say it confirmed it, uh, but uh, I could be mistaken. I, we, we could get more information that I feel like would confirm it. Right now, I'm not sure if I would say it confirms it, but I do think that it's, uh, it's, just, it's definitely drawn a connection between the dream Sarah that we saw in, in that episode and uh, Sarah Palmer here. Or, or not dream Sarah, but uh, dream Laura. Mm -hmm. um, I also... Uh, this well, let's keep talking about Sarah Palmer. I had another thought, but that's completely unconnected to that. Um, so, what did you think about this revelation? Uh, do you think? Because see, at first I was thinking Sarah isn't entirely con in control of whatever happens when she takes her face off because she puts her face back on and then she screams for a second. And at first I was thinking, okay, she doesn't know what's going on, or she knows but she's not in control. Like she knows something is going to happen, but she doesn't know what. And at first I was thinking, okay, she doesn't know how this guy died. And then the bartender seems to know, and he's like, we'll see what happens here. And she says, oh, yeah, it's a mystery. And she's very deadpan when she says that. Uh, so now I'm thinking she does know what's going on. She is going to control her actions. So uh, that'll be interesting to see where they take this subplot. I feel like the evil inside of her has kind of taken over. Um, throughout this whole thing, we've always been saying, wow, I, I feel like uh, Sarah Palmer, there's something wrong in her house. You know, there's somebody in there with her. Uh, I really hope she's okay. Uh, something's wrong with her. Uh, it now appears that 
she is maybe you know the victim of a supernatural force Mm -hmm. but she is also she is the conduit right i really like this idea where we first meet her and we think oh there's somebody in there with her referring to the house Mm -hmm. but no there actually is something in there in her mind with her and i think that's really kind of creepy and crazy and after what happened to her uh family she's just been extremely depressed and i guess she's been depressed since before her family died Mm -hmm. because if you remember from fire walk with me she can't stop smoking right Uh, and and it's a very depressing image uh so here it seems like she's just become more and more depressed and uh it it seems like that evil that's kind of come from that anger and that grief has manifested into this evil spirit and maybe that's been there since she was a child and Um, and maybe that's why she was able to see bob in the original series maybe yeah that might have something to do with her visions what does the white horse have to do with this because if you remember the uh i know you hated part eight but the woodsman says the horse is the white of the eyes and dark within Mm -hmm. uh she has dark within and she sees a white horse um, yeah, um, I, I didn't remember that, uh, but you've been rewatching past episodes. I haven't been, so uh, that was like seven or eight weeks ago. So I I was wasn't remembering that, or that wasn't uh, in my mind whenever I was watching this episode. I didn't even think about that. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think? Uh, do you, Do you think that Sarah is going to somehow be like a big part of the uh, series finale, or do you think this is just like you said, just to kind of draw a connection between that girl in the black and white episode and Sarah Palmer. I, uh, I, I do think this, this does propel something where uh, we've been thinking, Oh, something bad's coming to twin peaks. I think that something bad might be Sarah Palmer. Um, perhaps, or at least she will be so like, they will come out of her face and come to take away this sort of stuff. Um, Um, I can't remember what I was going to say, but never mind. Um, well, it, go, going away from Sarah Palmer for a little bit, uh, I kind of liked the Andy stuff in this episode um, for a specific weird reason. Uh, if you remember back when you and I were both pitching what we would each do in a Twin Peaks Season 3, uh, my idea was that Andy was going to become the new uh, agent of the law who would be somewhat connected to all the weird supernatural stuff in Twin Peaks, and that he was going to be uh, talking with uh, Mrs. Tremont's grandson, and he would uh, be kind of a big brother, little brother uh, program, and that he would be getting all this mystical information from him, and then he would be giving it to the police. Uh, That's kind of sort of what we get here, except without all of the uh, big brother, little brother stuff. Like, Andy is plucked out of the real world and put into the weird fictional world and then he's given some information and then he comes back and he says okay here's what we have to do and then they go and do it uh i kind of like that um i am afraid that we're not going to get to see them build on that because uh at the end of twin peaks season one we got to see andy you know suddenly he's awesome and he takes charge and he shoots uh jacques renault and then uh for the rest of season two he's kind of a bumbling idiot again i'm kind of afraid we're gonna have something like that where in this episode He's not the Andy that we know who's kind of a bumbling idiot. He's kind of a little bit more serious, and he's uh, taking this situation into his control. I'm afraid we're not going to see them build up on that, though. Um, see, here's the thing, though. Um, I feel like when it comes to the supernatural situation, he'll know how to handle it, but he's still going to be simple Andy. Uh, I really do like what we do with him because he enters the White Lodge, and I think he goes there because he is the purest of heart. Uh, yeah, uh, I'd say out of all the ones there, definitely, yeah. Um, uh, so I know you, how did, how did you feel about the whole sequence who gets these visions from the, from, I guess we can now call them the firemen? Uh, I, I kind of like that. Uh, I, like I said, uh, you know, when we were doing our pitches for Twin Peaks Season 3, uh, my idea was that he would have this new connection with the mystical world, and of course this is entirely different from how I thought it could play out, but I like that Andy is the one getting these mystical visions. I don't know if we're going to keep getting that. Uh, It would be neat if, see, this is what I would have liked to have seen, like, in episode one of this season. Like, have Andy start getting visions, and then they start going on a quest because Andy is giving them information. Um, 
I don't know if he's going to get more visions. Uh, like you, I was kind of thinking some of this stuff was stuff that we were going to see later on in the season, but it could just be that they filmed some new stuff and they just threw it in there, but it's not going to be stuff in the future. Maybe. Um, how do you feel about his name being the Fireman? Uh, that's okay. Uh, I always just called him the Giant. I'm probably still going to call him the Giant. Yeah, I mean, I, I will as well. But what I think is interesting is, remember when Hawk was looking at his map a few episodes ago, and he was talking about, you know, uh, that's fire. No, no, that's a fire symbol. Mm-hmm. Uh, more akin to what would be today's electricity. And Truman asks him, is it a good fire or is it bad fire? And he says, well, it depends on the intent behind him. Mm-hmm. And... What I think is interesting is he, I guess, is the one who controls the fire, right? He's the fireman. Yeah. And I saw somebody speculating, and I think he's right, where he has to control the fire. Fire meaning Bob, and he has to put him out. He needs to bring him back. He needs to control him. Mm-hmm. And that's what I think is kind of an interesting double entendre. And also, uh, Fire Walk With Me. Uh, it's, yeah. It's in yeah. the title. Uh, I wasn't putting that much thought into it, but now that you've spelled it out, uh, I guess that does add a layer to uh, this character that wasn't there before. And uh, what's interesting, though, is if you look at the credits, even going all the way back to the original series, the giant is never credited as the giant. Mm-hmm. He is just a series of question marks. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't know that. I, I, I never stay for the credits, though, so I, uh, that's something that I think you, you probably stay for the credits a lot more than I do. Uh, so you probably like uh, you probably stayed through the credits of this episode. I, I didn't, uh, but that is interesting. Yeah, I, I think it's kind of fun that we all call him the giant, but he's always accredited as I think like six or seven question marks. And I'm thinking, oh, well, that's kind of fun. Well, he's just the giant though. Mm-hmm. But now it seems like I don't think they deliberately had a name for him way back. Maybe they did, you know? Maybe they did and plan on revealing that he is the fireman in season three if they if they ever got that because he is just a mystery in season two. And then I don't even think we got him in Fire Walk with me. And then now that we finally have him back, we can do more uh, with him. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I I like that uh, in this episode, um, oh, I was going somewhere with Andy and, uh, and Lucy. Uh, I like that we didn't get uh, this dumb little scene where Lucy is like, hey, why is Andy carrying this naked woman in here? Uh, I like that she's instantly like, here, let me go get some clothes for her. And, like, there, we don't hit this stupid jealousy scene uh, like I would have expected in the original series. Yeah, if this were the back half of season two, we would have a whole thing of, like, Hoo! Yeah, exactly. Um, what did you think about them arresting Chad and how that scene played out? Okay, so it's weird. Like, it just happens. Mm-hmm. I'm sure in future episodes we'll get more of information of how they were on to him because as of part four... Uh, Bobby and Sheriff Truman are like, yeah, we have no idea how these drugs are coming in. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe they, he's, he, maybe he's been on uh, record, but if you remember, Lucy was looking out the window and saw him intercept the letter, or at least saw him. Med- she found that whole scene very suspicious, whether or not she saw him mess with the mail or not. And maybe she relayed this information, and this was the straw that broke the yeah the straw that broke the camel's back. Maybe that's the case. Uh, but it also leads to my God bless you, Hawk moment of the week. God bless you, Hawk. The way you – that one-liner you said after yep. you guys booked Chad is the best line I think you've had all season. Mm-hmm. What is it? I'll have my roast beef with cheese. Yeah, and it's, <laughs> it's so hostile. So... It's not even like, well, that's taken care of. Here's your sandwich. It's here's your roast beef and cheese. Like, he just seems so angry at Sheriff Truman, and I'm thinking, why? Like, you just got the bad guy. Why are you so, like, angry and bitter about that sandwich? Um, I, I didn't read him as him being angry or bitter. I just read it as, like, yeah, we just took care of him. I'll have that roast beef with cheese. <laughs> it's, it's such, like, it's like, a, it's like a 90s, 80s, 90s Arnold Schwarzenegger one-liner. Yeah. And um, it's, it's so great. I love that. As far as uh, Chad getting arrested, uh, I think it would have made more sense if they didn't know who was dealing these drugs, and then Lucy said, hey, uh, he was doing something weird, and then this girl, you know, she's in the hospital, and she tells uh, the police, uh, I sent you guys a letter, 
uh, that Richard Horn killed that boy, and they're like, okay, we didn't get a letter, and then they put two and two together. In this episode, though, uh, one of them says, we've been on to you for months. Uh, so that whole thing goes out the window. I think it would have made a lot more sense if they figured it out based on what happened in this season, uh, if they figured it out based on Lucy giving them information and then that girl in the hospital giving them information. Uh, but as is, it makes it seem like they've known it was him and they were waiting for him to lead them to a higher up in the organization. And then it's like, well, now there's a child dead and there's a woman who's almost dead, so we better just go ahead and arrest him. Uh, it's still a little weird that it just like, hey, Chad, come in here. We got a sandwich for you. All right, you're under arrest, Chad. Like, they could have just gone to his desk and arrest him. Or you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, I didn't have anything else about that other than like, uh, I was just thinking it would have made more sense if it had been because of information in this season uh, instead of them keeping an eye on him for several months. Yeah, I really like the part, though, where he's like, all right, roast beef with cheese, turkey with cheese, ham with cheese, and just cheese. I think Hawk goes, who ordered just cheese? And then he goes, oh, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> and what I like about this is you can actually read this as a bit of a character thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, Hawk is like roast beef with cheese, and and, and Bobby's like probably turkey with cheese or something. Like there's, the, they have cheese in them, but they're also got these different kind of meats, you know. They're, but then uh, Andy's just simple. No, nope, just he's just cheese, you mm -hmm. know. And maybe that kind of reads into he's the purest and most innocent of them, and that's why he gets to go into the White Lodge is because he is just cheese. Yeah, probably. Um, that's and again, that's something I wasn't really putting much thought into it, but once you kind of spelled out like that, I think it does. Uh, make a little bit more sense that way. Um, trying to think of anything else uh, that is worth discussing here. Uh, so you were probably surprised. You, you said you were surprised that uh, Diane is uh, Janie's uh, half sister. Uh, do we want to talk about that a little bit? Uh, yeah. Oh, wait, this nuclear bomb of an opening scene. Mm -hmm. Pardon the pun. <laughs> um, I, I, I was. I, I guess because I wasn't thinking that because you were the one you were saying that you thought that Janie and uh, Dougie's son were both uh, constructs created by evil uh, Cooper. I wasn't as sold on that theory. I was uh, we knew that Dougie was almost certainly a construct, but uh, I wasn't 100 percent sure that his wife and son were also. I guess this says they're not. Uh, I was uh, a little I don't know, like it seems like they're going out of their way to try and like. It's almost like if you have a long-running character who's been in the show for a really long time, and then you say, oh, here's that character's brother that we've never told you about. So it's like, well, we have to say that it's his half-brother, and we have to say that they're estranged, and that's why we never heard about them. Uh, I feel like they could have just said, yeah, she's my sister. But they're like, well, we're estranged, and she's my half-sister, and that's why you've never heard about me before. And it's like, well, we've only been with these characters for, like, you know, a few months and I, I didn't feel like they had to go that far to say, well, they're estranged and they're only half-sisters. Uh, maybe I'm just nitpicking. I don't know. I mean, it's just a detail. I, I don't really care that much. Mm -hmm. um, the, I, the I don't either. Is... I, was, I don't either. I, I don't care that much either. I, was just, I thought it was a little weird. Oh, okay. Uh, my read on this... Okay, so I know a little bit about Laura Dern and Naomi Watts' real-life relationship. Mm -hmm. So I thought this was awesome. So apparently Laura Dern and uh, Naomi Watts live on the same street. Huh. And uh, David Lynch bought a new house on that same street without knowing they both lived there. And the two of them got together and they're like, hey, let's go badger David Lynch and like try to, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge him to make a movie with us. <laughs> so then they did. And then he was like, oh, hello, ladies. So you kind of hung out with him for an afternoon. And he said he wasn't really making any more movies, but that... And I think it's just kind of funny that he made them sisters. And I think that's kind of funny. That is neat. Um, yeah, I didn't know that. Um, uh, I, of course, that has really nothing to do with the actual story that's being told here, but just on a behind-the-scenes level. I, I just like that. I think it's kind of neat. Um, I also it's, – it's crazy that um, did Doppel Cooper make Dougie – he, he, so he constructed Dougie. That's just what I'm going on. Mm -hmm. Did he do that knowing that he would get together with her half-sister because he spent time with Diane before disappearing? Uh, did, yeah, I think was, so. Before they were estranged, was he the cause of them being estranged so that uh, Diane didn't know about Dougie because, you know, Dougie looks like Kyle MacLachlan? So I'm just really curious about this whole situation. Uh, I think because... 
it seems to me that Diane is willingly working with Evil Cooper. Uh, that's what I've been taking from this so far, uh, that she is not under his control, but she is willingly working with him. So I'm thinking that something happened uh, shortly after uh, Good Cooper was taken into the lodge uh, where he was able to get Diane under his control, and then that kind of escalated the uh, tensions between the sisters, and that is what started the, uh, the schism between the two. That's what I'm thinking. Like, uh, from Janie's point of view, it's like, well, my sister hasn't been the same for 25 years. Something weird happened 25 years ago. I don't know what, and now we just can't talk anymore because she's, uh, she's different. She does, she's not the same as she used to be. Yeah, maybe. I don't think... Okay, so Diane's an enigma right now to me. I don't know what her true allegiance is, and I like that. Um, I think that after that night she had with Evil Cooper... If that changed her and like hardened her and uh, she built up a shield around her. Mm -hmm. uh, I, but then at the same time, we're told that she was always been like a tough cookie. So I don't know. Um, either way, I think it's interesting that uh, her half sister gets married and has a child that's with a person who's a construct of evil Cooper. That is just way too much of a coincidence. Well, I, and I'm thinking it's maybe not as much of a coincidence as it seems. Uh, if we're going with what I think and that – see, I, Diane has not done anything trustworthy this entire season. So uh, I don't have any reason to think that she is maybe still redeemable. I think that she is 100 percent working with Doppel Cooper, as you call him. Uh, and I think maybe once he got her under his control, he created Dougie and sent him to get with uh, Diane's sister. For what reason, I don't know. Uh, but I think that he did it deliberately. I think that that was a deliberate – she was a deliberate target because of who she's related to. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I'm agreeing. That's why I'm like, that's oh. too much of a coincidence. Oh, it gotcha. Has yeah. to be. Um, maybe uh, – I don't know. Because the thing is, when they approach Diane about her being deputized, they're already on to her. Right. The same way that the Twin Peaks Sheriff's Department is on to Chad, basically, mm -hmm. right? They, they, there's like, we're on to you, Diane. But they deputize her. And her response, like, I don't know, maybe some, uh, the way Laura Dern's acting in her face, it's like, I have a way to get out from under Cooper's grasp. Yeah, let's rock. Let's do this. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I'm reading into it. Maybe I'm reading into it wrong, but I feel like she got involved with Cooper because it was the man she thought she knew, but it wasn't actually him. And then she realized that too late. Mm -hmm. And now she sort of, she sort of has to, to not die. But she also was now trying to find a way out. Maybe she feels an overwhelming amount of guilt because she's the one who led Cooper to her sister. Like, I don't know. I, all of this information was like, just, what? This has to mean something. And it was just this insane atomic bomb that just got dropped on me. Mm -hmm. uh, I, the only thing I can think of is if she was uh, unwillingly a pawn of Evil Cooper... I feel like she would have said something by now, uh, even if she didn't like Gordon and Al, and she's just like, I don't want to be with you guys. Like, she's been very hostile with them uh, for a really long time now. Uh, even if she didn't like them, if she saw them as a way to get away from Evil Cooper, I think that she would have said something by now, but then again, maybe not. Maybe she's playing both sides. I don't know. Right. Um, that's why I say she's an enigma. And that's, right. Uh, so... Gordon Cole's Monica Bellucci dream. <laughs> yeah, that was wow. that was weird. Um, and... I remember Monica Bellucci being on the cast list, and I completely forgot about it. And he said, "I had another one of my Monica Bellucci dreams," and I went, "You have got to be kidding me! Is she going to be playing herself?" Mm -hmm. And she does. That was I thought that was wonderful. The perfectly amount of absurd and hilarious, but also legitimately haunting. Like, oh my god, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. So, uh, what did you think of all this? Um, well, at first, I thought it was just going to be a funny little one-liner thing. Like, um, like you remember in season two when uh, Donna said uh, she said something about uh, she's been getting headaches uh, since she started smoking, and uh, then James said, "How long have you been smoking?" And she said, "Since I started getting headaches, or something like that." Like. Just a weird little, oh, that's a Twin Peaksy line. I thought it was going to be something like that, where, like, he would say, I had another one of my Monica Belushi, or, Mon yeah, Monica Belushi dreams, uh, and then we would just cut to another scene. Like, oh, that Gordon Cole, he's goofy and wacky. And then it ended up being, like, an actual plot thing, like, where he launches into a flashback from Fire Walk With Me, and 
I wonder if this is like the closest we're going to see uh, David Bowie in the series because I keep asking that every week. Like, are we going to get some of the last footage that David Bowie filmed before he died? Because they have made Philip Jeffries like a character in the show now. Um, you know, he was in Fire Walk with me, but they've been talking to him on the phone, or they've been talking to someone who claims that he's Philip Jeffries, and. I've been wondering, okay, are they going to pull David Bowie in, or did they pulp any David Bowie footage they had because he died? Uh, and then we get archive footage of him and uh, Gordon Cole, Albert, and Cooper from Fire Walk With Me. Uh, so uh, I'm guessing this, I mean, this, on the one hand, you could say, well, this makes uh, pr uh, uh, Philip Jeffries even more of an important character in this show, but it also, to me, like when I was seeing that, I was thinking, oh, that's probably the closest that we're going to see this character in this season. Uh, what do you think? Uh, the same thought crossed my mind. Um, the biggest thing from this that I took from is, I guess they just didn't remember that. Yeah, that was weird. Because, um, you know, you and I were kind of, I wouldn't say arguing, but you thought that the first, like, 25 to 30 minutes of Fire Walk With Me was all a dream. And I wasn't sure. I was thinking, well, it's, Maybe not a dream. Maybe it's just, you know, uh, a flashback, and it doesn't have any... Well, I won't say it doesn't have anything to do, but it has very little to do with the rest of the movie. Uh, this maybe seems to indicate that it wasn't a dream, or if it yep. was a dream, it still happened. You know what I'm saying? Like, it was a yes. dream, but it also actually happened. Uh, because uh, at first I was thinking, oh, Connor's right. This was a dream, and now it's a shared dream. You know how Cooper and Laura were having shared dreams... Uh, even though they had never met each other, I was thinking, well, maybe this is like a delayed shared dream between Cooper and Cole. Uh, but then Albert says he remembers it too. Uh, so that was weird. And like you said, it is strange that it's like, oh, yeah, I remember that. Uh, but I guess maybe you could say, well, a lot of weird stuff happens to these guys, especially if they're on the Blue Rose cases. So maybe they just uh, put it in the back of their mind because it was one of those weird things that never went anywhere. So they forgot about it. Yeah. Um it really seems like they had plans. Like, cause we, we found out that Fire Walk with me was supposed to be the first in a trilogy of Twin Peaks films. Mm -hmm. And it seems like they're taking those ideas from those movies and splicing it together with other ideas they had, if they would have gotten a season three, yeah. but also new ideas. And I really think this is a really neat melting pot of all of those concepts. Mm -hmm. It kind of reminds me of, so I'm a big X-Men fan, as you know, and uh, Chris Claremont is my favorite X-Men writer. He was on the X-Men books for 16 years, and uh, as he, shortly after he left in like 91, I think, uh, well, it may have been a few years after he left, but a lot of people kept pestering him about, uh, what would you have done if you stayed on the X-Men? Because there was a lot of ideas that he threw out there. Uh, there were ideas that he was leading up to something. He was building on to something, and then he kind of abruptly leaves, and he ties up some of the stuff he was doing, but he didn't tie everything up. And then he basically revealed in an interview, like, all of his ideas that he had. Like, he was going to kill off Charles Xavier permanently, and he was going to have this really extended uh, war with the Shadow King and all this stuff. And then he eventually comes back to the X-Men in the early 2000s, and he uses some of those ideas. Uh, he brought back the Shadow King and Extreme X-Men in the early 2000s. And then he was doing this series called X-Men Forever, which was pretending like, or it was allegedly pretending like he had never left in X-Men in 1991 or 92, uh, basically saying, like, okay, what if Chris Claremont never left? This would be, like, the next issue, except it was nothing like the ideas that he said he was going to do, and I think part of that was because he had already revealed some of his ideas that he had uh, that he was going to use, so he had to create new ideas. Um, it's one of those things, uh, if you're right, if this season is, like, a merging of uh, the two Fire Walk With Me sequels and what would have been Twin Peaks Season 3, in a way, it makes me wish that we had just gotten those sequels instead of this, uh, because I, I haven't been liking this as much as you have. Uh, I know you've been really liking it, but for me, uh, seeing some of these ideas here, like, I really wish we could have gotten two more Twin Peaks movies. Like, get one that just focuses on the FBI. Uh, my favorite thing about Twin Peaks is all of the FBI agents, and it would have been really cool if we could have seen, like, an entire movie focusing on the Blue, Ro the Blue Rose team and, like, get more about Philip Jeffries and seeing bits and pieces. Yeah, that was supposed to be the sequel. Yeah, exactly. And seeing it play out here but also differently makes me just wish we could have had what we what they wanted to do. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but the you know why we couldn't have sequels, though, right? Well, because people didn't like Fire Walk With Me and they gave it bad reviews. No, it got disastrous reviews. It's one of the worst-reviewed movies of all time upon release. Well, yeah, yeah. 
and it was a huge financial bomb as well. Okay. It only cost ten million dollars. It made like two. Ooh, yeah, that is. Yeah, that yeah. Even if like they went through New Line Cinema, which is sort of like the trashy version of Warner Brothers, like they went through a lower end studio for distribution, and it's like it, like even then, no one would like. You couldn't go to like Lionsgate or Miramax or some other low end distribution company and release a movie because they say, "Look, it you cost ten million dollars to make. That's not counting marketing cost, and your last film nobody liked. What makes you think that you know you have to cover your production costs before you cover marketing and distribution costs, which is what a distributor does? And if they're not even going to see any return on their investment because no one liked your last movie." there's no reason to believe anyone more would come to see this movie. So any idea of sequels was completely thrown out the window because no distribution company would touch it, even if it was 100% funded on a production level by David Lynch. Yeah, uh, I knew about most of that, uh, and I understand why they didn't make the movies. I just What I'm saying is seeing them take those ideas and alter those ideas and then add new ideas just makes me wish we could have had those sequels, is what I'm saying. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I yeah, I agree. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other like big things that happened in this episode that are uh, worth talking about. Um, so, what do you think, of British Iron Fist? Uh, his dialogue with uh, see, I wasn't getting an Iron Fist vibe the whole time. The way he was describing this to James, it reminded me of the movie The Princess Bride. Have you seen that movie? I did. I actually saw that at a drive-in theater. It was awesome. Okay, yeah. Uh, I watched it recently. I was sick recently, and I watched it when I was sick. That's kind of uh, one of those movies I will always watch when I'm feeling awful because, you know, the kid in the movie is sick. Um, yep. And yep. Yeah, I got to do that. The, uh, the conversation in that movie between Inigo and the man in black, uh, when Inigo is saying, uh, I've studied my whole life uh, swordplay, and uh, uh, when I'm strong enough, I will say, hello, my name. Like, his uh, tone of voice kind of reminds me of the British guy in this episode, like the way he's talking about it. And like, they're even sitting down in the same like placement. Uh, like if James was the man in black and, uh, iron fist was, uh, Inigo, like they're kind of sitting in the same position as they were in that movie. And like British iron fist, his tone of voice kind of reminds me of Inigo a little bit. Uh, I was hardly even paying attention to what he was saying. I was just so fixated. I'm like, this almost feels like it's a remake of that scene. Um, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, that, once you just uh, said that about British Iron Fist, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I guess so, yeah. Okay, so I heard somebody on the internet theorizing, and I think they might be right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's... He exists to arm wrestle Evil Coop. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that would be great. Like, if, if you just, like... I... <laughs> that would be amazing. Um, did, we because... know, did we know that he was British when we saw him at the beginning of the season? Yeah, he has one line where he's like, I'm going to go get a drink. Okay, I didn't hear I, – I didn't remember hearing him talk. So I was, like, thinking as we were – as I was watching this episode, I was thinking, uh, is this the first time we've heard him speak? Uh, so – and he's wearing a glove there, too. Uh, right. I thought like a cast that he had, like, drawn on with Sharpie. Yeah, I was thinking I, – I thought maybe it was, like – I mean, he looks young. He looks like he's, like, in his early 20s. And, you know, I, that's what made me think maybe he was going to be uh, Andy and Lucy's kid. Uh, so I thought, I don't know. I was thinking, like, is he an artist? Is this, like, something to do with, like, he was in the middle of painting a picture and he took one glove off and left one on? Like, I really didn't know what was going on with that glove. Uh, but uh, I was thinking, I, I, I will tell you this, I was not thinking that he uh, uh, got a vision from the fireman and that he's uh, wearing that glove and it gave him superpowers. I wasn't, giving, I wasn't thinking that at all. And he has to wear it. Right. Uh, and so that's what I'm thinking is, like, the fireman is, like, creating an army against Doppelcooper. And mm -hmm. the Doppelcooper's on his way to Twin Peaks, and that's why he needs to be here. And that's what I really think is cool. And this guy exists to at least, like, maybe punch him really hard. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or maybe Nadine's going to, like, give him a karate kick to the face and just send him flying back. I don't know. Um, the twin I also thought that. What's that? Oh, I was going to say something stupid. The Twin Peaks version of, like, the Justice League. like. Uh... Yeah, no, that's what I'm thinking, too. It would be incredible. Mm -hmm. um, heroes, now more than ever on Twin Peaks. Uh, the thing oh, is... Dr. Jacoby will have one of his golden shovels. He'll, like, uh, deca yeah! decapitate him and say, That's what you need a shovel for! To shovel out all the guts and the brains that are spilling out of Cooper's head! <laughs> yeah, that would be great. And then he would... Uh, or maybe he could, like, 
throw it like a trident, like Aquaman or something. <laughs> that would be good, yeah. <laughs> uh, the king of the apps! He's here! <laughs> And don't, be, don't forget Jerry, uh, which, by the way, no Jerry in this episode. Uh, I was, was going to say that. I thought he, they would run into him in the woods. Uh, or, like, uh, maybe not him, but, like, uh, someone else in the woods. Like, uh, Sarah Palmer is burying this body or whatever, and then it's like, oh, hey, Jerry. And he's like, ah, ah, ah. And then he just, like, <laughs> runs off, and he's still screaming at his foot. Uh, yeah. That, oh, my goodness. Maybe, maybe his foot is going to join the battle. <laughs> um, but just his foot. Yeah, just the foot. He'll cut off his leg and it will turn into somebody. Um, <laughs> oh man, yeah, no, I love this episode. I, I it cranked things up into high gear. Mm-hmm. I'm so sad we only have three episodes, sorry, three weeks left before episodes. So, ah, oh, this is a bummer. Uh, it also sucks that this premieres on Sundays and all anyone talks about now is Game of Thrones, and it's like, come on, guys, come on, Twin Peaks is happening and it's doing incredible stuff. Yeah, uh, I, I haven't been enjoying it as much as you. You know that. Um. I don't watch Game of Thrones, so uh, uh, at least I'm not uh, going uh, and talking about Game of Thrones online. Yeah, yeah. I do have three, uh, three or four of the Game of Thrones books. I haven't read them, but I own them. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, isn't the book called like A Song of Fire and Ice or something? Like... Yeah, yeah, that's the first book. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's like I think the whole series is called Game of Thrones. I think I don't know. Oh. I, I haven't read any of the books. I uh, I bought them. I've been intending to. To read them once uh, what's his face finishes but you know that could take like three billion years for him to finish i don't know you can be an elder by the time that happens yeah <laughs> yeah and then, and then by, by, the, by the amount of time it'll take you to actually read them oh i know because i'm a sl- i'm a ridiculously slow reader you read books about as slowly as i read comics <laughs> um so i'm trying to think oh oh i had something so you were saying you thought that harry had sent a message to gordon I didn't read it that way, but it's possible that I missed something. I was thinking that uh, Frank sent a message to the FBI because they got these uh, the weird little uh, uh, fortune cookie things that said Cooper Cooper, and uh, then Frank sends a message to the FBI, and Gordon Cole gets a message that says uh, Sheriff Truman wants to talk to you, and then he assumed, oh, it's Harry, and then he'll send a call, and it's like, Harry, is that you? And he's like, no, Harry's in the hospital. That was kind of what I thought. Okay, you know what, you, you're probably right there. Because uh, uh, he has gotten all that information this season. Because uh, I was trying to think of, like, well, maybe he got some information, like, before the series started. But I'm thinking that's what it was. Okay, you're probably right. Um, Do you think we're so, going to get Michael Ontkeen show up with just, like, a cameo? Because he, I, I, he, he said he was pretty sure he wasn't coming back. And at this point, they've got a good way to write him out by saying he's sick. But I'm wondering, I mean, they keep talking about him. It'd be really funny if he came back in the last episode and, like, nobody was expecting it. That would be cool. Uh, it'd also be cool if David Bowie somehow showed up. I know, uh, and I, that would be, it would be bitter, but it would also be, like, it'd be a bittersweet thing. Like, you know, because this would very much be the last thing that he filmed, or one of the last things. Yeah, he probably did it before shooting his music video for Dark Star or something. Mm-hmm. Um, uh So, one more thing about the Monica Bellucci dream. Mm -hmm. This kind of confirms a thing that I know I've been, I've always thought. This kind of brings it to light. It's the part where Philip Jeffrey says, Who do you think that is there? when he points at Cooper. Yeah, and I think you had mentioned that in one of our podcasts, and I don't remember which one, but I was watching that and I was thinking, Oh, Connor's going to flip his lid over that. And I didn't remember what it was, but you had mentioned that before. It's been since we started this season because of the multiple Coopers and. Evil Cooper uh, being on this plane and Bob taking over him and stuff like that. But yeah, that, that yeah. came to my mind also. And I guess Cooper is the dreamer, right? He's living inside the dream, which I guess we could just call the Black Lodge or something. Or maybe, you know, he's he's in Dougie Jones's life, but he's sort of in a dream state. Yeah, and, you know, Gordon Cole was saying he had a dream, so maybe he's also the dreamer. I don't know. I don't know. This is all so insane. If, um, if we took... I also... Like, if we if we made a list of like all of the characters who are dreamers, like we'd have several characters who would qualify. I think Cooper is the most likely, but there could be multiple people who are like possibly the dreamer. Yeah, uh, this this episode, man, it was it was insane. Uh, I also like that Andy d- deliberately gets an image of the two Coopers. Mm-hmm. So, and uh, now he's like, oh man, that creepy Gene Simmons looking one. That's the bad one. <laughs> And I guess he also gets the abridged history of the Black Lodge. And uh, 
I don't remember if you, yeah, he did, yeah, he saw the light guy, um, which I was, I didn't ever have to see him again, uh, he was really creepy, like, you were talking about how creepy this episode was, that guy is probably the creepiest thing I've ever seen on television, um, oh, yeah, that, he, he gives Bob a run for his money, definitely, um, but the, uh, I also thought it was strange, uh, in the very first episode of Twin Peaks, uh, we saw um, this girl running across the courtyard screaming. And that was right before Donna yeah. found out that Laura died. We see that in the dream. I thought that was weird. We also saw that before the opening credits of the very first episode. Of this season? Of this season. Oh, okay. Because this season opened up with, Hello, I, J. Cooper. I'll see you again in 25 years. Mm-hmm. And then she says, Meanwhile, and then it fades to black. And then it shows a couple of ominous images. We see the smokestacks of the of the law of the log. Uh, wow, the sawmill, right? Mm-hmm. And then we see that woman, that girl running across the courtyard, but it's in really slow motion. And then we see uh, Laura Palmer. Then we, see, then we see the hallways of the high school, and we see the picture of Laura Palmer, and then it says Twin Peaks. Mm-hmm. And that was the. Fr- and then from there, it just kind of becomes the usual opening credits with the waterfall and the red curtains and the tile floor. So, not the tile for a while, the black and white chevron pattern floor. Mm-hmm. I just think that's an interesting, like, that's what they did, and then that image comes back around. I think that's interesting. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that, like, getting back to that girl running across the courtyard, like, I feel like she's a relatively minor, like, we don't even know who that girl is. It's a very striking image, like, seeing her running across the courtyard screaming. That's a very, it's something memorable from that episode. But yeah. she's also so minor compared to everything else in the series, so I thought it was weird that this is now the second time they brought that back this season. Maybe it's Renee, <laughs> the chick that James wants to get with. Hey, maybe. Uh, maybe it's so Tina. We found out some pretty critical information this uh, episode that she's married. Uh, yeah. So, so James is just a creepy, like, I want to get with a married woman kind of guy. When that guy, when British Iron Fist says, well, she is married, laddie. Uh, th- sorry, that was my, uh, that was... <laughs> when he says that, James, he just says, oh, son, you don't even know. All right, let me, let me tell you a story about the cougar lady. <laughs> and then he says, like, you ever hear legend of a woman named Evelyn Marsh? <laughs> <laughs> and he says, like, uh, this is just, I- I've had ladies like this for breakfast. Um, <laughs> and they taste pretty yeah, good. <laughs> yep, I was just going to say that. <laughs> um, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, that's okay. Hey, great minds think alike. Um, <laughs> So, uh, did you have anything else about this episode? Um, I guess not really. I, I love this episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, strongly contended for my favorite episode of the season. They really lean heavily into the horror stuff here, and I like that. This I like the callbacks to Fire Walk with me. Um, this was just like, oh, this was a really great meal to have once a week. Um, and, uh, this when when I saw the the clips from Fire Walk with me, like we have both said that all of the actors, oh, most of the actors who are in Twin Peaks, they've aged pretty well. Like Magic and Mick, uh, the lady who plays Norma, like the lady who plays Norma is in her seventies, but she doesn't I look know. like she doesn't look that old. Uh, and like uh, Kyle MacLachlan, uh, David Lynch, like they look pretty good for how old they are. But then like I see these clips from Fire Walk with me, and I'm like, who are these infants? Like. Whoa, look, look at this. Like, Kyle McLaughlin looks like he's 12. And I'm just like, holy cow, where did all the time go? And, like, Fire Walk With Me came out when I was literally, like, a toddler. So, like, that was a long time ago. But still, like, it's crazy how, like, I've said that they've aged very well. But then I look at this and I'm like, wow, like, where's all the time gone? Yeah, it's it's crazy. Um, wow. Um, I love this episode a lot. Um I'm just kind of bummed out that you're not liking this as much as I am. Uh, not, not, not that I'm saying there's anything wrong with you. I think you have perfectly valid points, but I know you have no motivation to go back and rewatch some stuff. But no, uh, yeah, it's it's just but, I think it's it's one of those things. Uh, if I had well, and I know there are people who started watching this season and had never watched any Twin Peaks anything before, and they're loving this season. Uh, like I know a guy who had never seen anything Twin Peaks was watching this, having the time of his life, and then he went back and watched all of the series in like three weeks or less and he's still loving this so you know i'm I, i've said before i'm in the minority um i i feel like it's one of those things where you know i first got into twin peaks like four years ago maybe and like i've had i haven't even had that much time to like build my anticipation for this season uh I'm, i can't imagine like the people who are huge david lynch fans who gr- like who watched twin peaks when it was first airing and then, like, we're getting hyped for this season. Because for me, like, I had very specific things in mind that I wanted to see. And 
I've gotten very little of that. Um, it's not necessarily that it's just not a good show. It's that I haven't gotten a show that I wanted. Um, and even taking away, like, my expectations, uh, it's just there's so much going on that it's hard for me to keep up with. Yeah, this show has so many identities at this point. Like, you look at last episode, and it's completely different than what we get here. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And, I mean, it's it's kind of like uh, we were talking about, uh, oh, we talked about this a lot when we were talking about season one and two, how it's a soap opera, and it's a, soap, a parody of soap operas. Now it's so many other things. It's a horror movie when you get to Fire Walk With Me. It's, you know, goodness gracious, there's so many different labels you can put on it once you get to season three. Mm -hmm. um, um, did ahead. you see that meme that was posted of Sarah Palmer taking off her face and below it was Jim Belushi's happy face when he sees the check for $30 million? <laughs> no, I didn't see that. That's funny. Uh, that was amazing. Yeah, I w uh, Connor had made a meme. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and mention this, Connor. Uh, you had submitted it to the – have we mentioned the Fire Walk with Memes Facebook page? We probably mentioned it. Okay. So there's a page. If you're on Facebook, it's called Fire Walk with Memes, and they post a whole bunch of uh, Twin Peaks stuff. I actually unfollowed the group or the page because I didn't want to get spoiled about stuff I hadn't seen yet. Uh, but Connor made a meme. I don't think they posted it yet, have they? No, they haven't. I'm it, disappointed. I know because I was looking through because so I was gone over the weekend, and Connor had sent me that Friday, and I like I had sent him a message, and then I was away from my computer for three days. And then I came back, and Connor was like, yeah, I submitted it to Fire Walk with Memes. So I'm looking through all of their pictures they posted, and I'm, like, going back as far as, like, August 8th. And I'm like, they haven't posted that picture. Uh, but Connor made a picture. I'm going to go ahead and tell them about it because I think it's funny. Uh, is uh, what you expect – or your expectations when you're driving a Lincoln, and it's Matthew McConaughey, and it's, like, your reality, and it's uh, Evil Cooper uh, wrecking the car and throwing up. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was funny. Uh, I like it, too. Um, yeah. I've had that in my mind since I first saw that. Uh-huh. But I finally made it because I got a free trial at Showtime. So. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, and if you guys are on Facebook, uh, check the Fire Walk with Memes page. Who knows? Maybe they'll uh, they'll post it. Uh, I don't know. Maybe they're just getting a whole lot of requests, like, uh, during uh... – <laughs> sorry, I just saw something else that was funny on that page, and I, uh, I it's inappropriate, so I'm not going to – I'm not going to – mention it anyway, <laughs> anyway uh maybe they'll post it maybe they're just getting a whole lot of uh requests and, or like submissions so they're like you know have a backlog i don't know but maybe, maybe but uh we will uh get back with you guys uh next week to talk about one of the last episodes i won't say it's it we're in the last like four no no this is so it'll be next week the week after and then the week after that but then it's four more episodes total um so uh, we will be back next week to talk about another episode uh, in the meantime, I am the Comics Kid 2099. And I am Connor Nielsen. And we will see you guys later. Have a good one.